Welcome to Breaking It All Down, I'm Count Zero. Sorry for the delay, I had a cold, get me under the weather, and messed with my voice. You can probably still hear it. Um, but I'm back now, and we'll be continuing on with a review of Need for Speed The Run. This game was the latest one in the series from Black Box Games, who brought us all of the narrative-focused Need for Speed games like Most Wanted, Carbon, and Undercover. As with those games, this one has something of a storyline to it. You play a street racer who's gotten in deep with the mob in the debt standpoint and wants out. So in order to pay his debts, you enter the run. A coast-to-coast -coast race from San Francisco to New York with a $25 million grand prize. In between some of the races, you get cutscenes and quick time event sequences of the press X to not die variety, as opposed to the more impressive press X to be awesome variety. Some of these involve some narrative, but the game's narrative is honestly so light to be non-existent. The game does put up put you up against some specific racers and or duels or pairs of racers, and it gives them a little bit of backstory with some brief on-screen text on the game in the game's loading screens, but that's about it. Some of them get cutscenes where you can actually see their face in a full body model stuff, but not all of those racers get that. I kind of wonder if Black Box had something more ambitious in mind for the game's story, but for some reason or another, wasn't able to get that done in time. However, probably the game's worst problem is with its mechanics. Some of the problems are justified by the game's premise, but others not so much. For starters, all the game's races are point-to-point -point races. Straight line with some twists and turns and some obstacles in between. No lap races, no drift races, nothing much like that. They do try to change things up by having various mission objectives, like some races having you needing to pass a certain number of racers before you reach the end of the track. Or others being checkpoint races, where you need to get past certain checkpoints within a certain length of time to get time back. The problem is that all of these are still kind of, you're going in a straight line, it becomes samey, and it mars the experience. To the credit of the game designers, though, they do do a decent job of making the backdrops for the game's levels look different and kind of interesting to change things up somewhat, but otherwise, it's still very much point A to point B, and then wash, rinse, repeat. Races occur in stages, with each stage containing multiple races, all played in sequence. You can stop playing at any time and continue where you left off, as far as starting that race from the beginning. The problem is you can't go back to specific races in the stage after you've completed them, which is a problem because you cannot change your car between races. If you want to change cars, you have to basically be on a track that uses a gas station. Um... What you do is you drive to the gas station, this pauses the race while you select your new car, and then you pick back up again after you've selected your car. As part of this, though, you also can't customize your car's engine specifications very much. They might give you several different cars of the same model, but with different performance characteristics. But you can't go, okay, I want to adjust my car to reflect my driving style, you instead have to pick a car that selects your driving style. There's also the added problem of not much opportunity for appearance customization on the vehicles as well. No choices of decals, vinyls, or anything like that. All sorts of stuff that were big things in earlier games in the series, particular ones by, Bra by Black Box themselves. The problem is, not every stage has a gas station, and not all cars work well for every stage. Some cars work better for uh, sharp-turning uh, city routes, some work better for high-traffic roads, where you're dodging and weaving through cars, both incoming and outgoing, and um, traffic that's in, actually in your lane. And some cars work better for twisty, turny, weavy country roads. If now... The problem is, if you pick the wrong car on a stage which has a uh, gas station on it, and you manage to somehow blunder through the stage, as I did, 
When you then go on to the next stage where that car won't work as well, you have no way to change your car and get the correct car for that stage. And that's a problem. Because since you cannot start a... Um, basically go back to a specific um, little race or stage within a sequence, within, within a... Uh, yeah, it's a race within a stage. The problem with, the, with, with this description here is the l l game is divided into stages, and the stages are divided into individual races. So, anyway. So, with a particular race and a stage, if you pick the wrong car in the race before it, blunder through, and then find yourself running into a wall, either metaphorically or literally, in the next race, you can't go back to the race before it, pick a different car, and then try it that way. You have to start the entire stage over, and that can take hours. Literally, seriously, it can take a few hours. Um, sometimes longer, depending on, on how difficult the race is. Um, sometimes less, depending on, again, depending on difficulty and how far in. But if you're getting in towards the end of the stage, when the problem comes up, you're in trouble. So, that causes a major, major issue with this racing game. Honestly, all racing games really should give you the option to select cars in between races. I kind of understand why they did it, but there, there, there's got to be a better way here. Because this hurts the quality of the game. Badly. Now, the game features EA's vaunted Autolog feature, which was introduced in the last Need for Speed game. The idea being is when you go through the races you are your, your times are compared with your other friends on your friends list who are pl who have played this game and kind of gives you something to go up against a mark to beat and several trophies are indeed related to the auto log on this so trophies and achievements problem is for me i wasn't able to test this out that much because none of my friends had played this game i'm on the 360 version so I have a slightly bigger friends list on the 360 version than on the PS... Well, on the 360 and the PS3, and none of the people playing it. So, if you have a lot of... This kind of causes a problem as far as the value of this feature of... If you have a bunch of friends who are playing this game, it's worth getting it. If you don't have a lot of friends that are playing this game, then the autolog isn't worth it. But then, if your friends aren't buying the game because fr their friends aren't buying the game, you can see how this gets out of hand. So, I can't recommend this game. There are enough problems with the very fundamental gameplay in this game to make it a pain in the neck to play. I'm going to recommend you give this game a miss. Well, I've got some time left. Um, let's talk about the Hugo Award nominees for Best Professional Artist. That's right, I'm reviewing art. Well, still paintings and stuff, but you get the drift. First up is Dan Dos Santos. Dos Santos' art style leans towards the photorealistic, as do a lot of the other ones people will be dealing with this time. Characters in his art look good. If I was to have a gripe, and it's a minor one, actually, maybe not so minor, it's most of the female characters in his art tend to have a body language of models as opposed to people who would be in situations like this. This is most pronounced in the piece A Beautiful Friendship. The character in this environment looks a lot less like she and her female... Fe feline companion are going to try and make their way through a hostile environment and instead it looks more like they're going to do their little turn on the catwalk. His art for the piece Endurance has a similar problem. The character in the art seems a little off balance for running on a roof. She's not leaning into the run on the slope of the roof and her knife really isn't a position for defense or attack. Ironically, if Dos Santos was aiming for fan service and the whole TNA aspect of things, then the appropriate pose in the, for the uh, situation, leaning forward into the run of the slope, would actually have the reader staring right down the character's cleavage, no matter what she was wearing, and it would be practical and provide the fan service there. But, nope, that's not what he went with. Next is Bob Eggleton. This is not Bob's first rodeo, having won this award eight times previously. Eggleton's focus is basically monsters. He's best known aside from doing various Magic the Gathering cards, for doing fan art for Godzilla. And he also 
does a lot of work in oils and charcoals, which is different from a lot, a lot of the other people here. And it looks good. It's not my cup of tea, but it's good. Michael Comark is next. He's done artwork for Magic the Gathering, along with Dungeons & Dragons, Shadowrun, and a whole bunch of other RPGs, as well as several of George R. R. Martin's wildcard novels, among various other things. His art, like Dos Santos, leans towards the photorealist with one big difference. Comark does his female characters much, much better. They look like people and characters, as opposed to models in front of a backdrop, and that brings a major difference in his favor. From France, we have Stéphane Martinier. His most notable, notable works include concept art for id Software's games Rage, along with a bunch of other video games, including Mortal Kombat vs. DC Universe, as well as doing co the cover art for The Dervish House, which is a book I previously reviewed and really enjoyed, and also doing some role-playing game book art, in particular the Mecha D20 source book from Guardians of Order. His art is more landscape focused than character focused, though characters make it in some of their some of his stuff as well. Finally, we have Joe Picacchio. His most recent work includes doing most of the art for the Game of Thrones calendar, and his work on the calendar is probably the most normal of his portfolio. The rest of his work is very stylized, combining elements of the realistic and the abstract, and makes for some really evocative book covers. Over. So, going over the nominees, who would I vote for? Honestly, everyone here is pretty good. With the sole complaints on my part of how Don um, Dos Santos draws women aside. Martinier, Piacolo, in, in particular, have work which I wouldn't mind seeing them hang on my wall. However, I have to pick one. So, I'm going to go with Comark. Um, he has art which I wouldn't mind hanging on my wall, and it, he, in a good way, reminds me of Frizz, uh, Frank Frazetta. Not in terms of the uh, cheesecake, beefcake aspect of the art, but in or the racially awkward character designs. It's that his art is visually dynamic. It's, it, it has a sense of motion and action to it that really catches my attention. Also, I mean, he has art in there from Shadowrun and from the Shadow Fist uh, CCG, or collectible card game, which in turn inspired my, one of my favorite tabletop role-playing games, Feng Shui. So, it kind of, so that, that helps. I actually look forward to seeing more of Comark's work in, in, future, in the future. And, yeah, I'm definitely going to give him my pick. So, as for next week, next week it's another week for a book and other stuff review, so I'm going to be taking a look at one of the books that was nominated for this year's Hugo Award for Best Novel. Specifically, I'm talking about, um, yeah, speak. Leviathan Wakes. I'm actually reading two of them at the moment, uh, Leviathan Wakes and Among Others by Joe Walton. If I finish Joe, if I finish Among Others by the time we get to uh, next week, I'll do a double feature with both of them. That way, I'll give everything enough time to get a full 15-minute episode, and that whole category will be dealt with, and I can give you my final pick for best novel. Also, later this week, I slash this weekend, I should see Battleship. I managed to get a free pass for that, so I will check it out, and I will give you my thoughts on the film. Until next time, thanks for watching.